got my apple cufflinks um, on and uh, I think it's pomegranate. So today's session is all about anybody uh, who wants to make a resolution in 2022, anyone who's wanting to exercise and put on more muscle, anyone who wants to exercise and lose fat, anyone who's exercising and worried like me at 47, that when I run on the treadmill, I'm like, okay, am I gonna get a heart attack or not? And I brought together two experts. My first expert coming in is uh, Dr. Ashish Contractor. He's an old friend. He's written a book called The Heart Truth. I'm gonna get him on board right now. And I have Shwetam Brichetti, who is an old friend of mine, uh, where we did a radio show together and we have continued to work together. I do Shwetambri's diet every now and then. She's recently become a mom and trust me, she looks the same when I knew she was a single person, fit as ever. So let me get both of them in over here. I think Dr. Ashish is in over here. Hey Ashish, how are you doing? Very good, Ryan. So happy, happy new year to you and to all the listeners. And you said Shwetambri looks the same as when you saw her years ago. <laughs> I have not seen her earlier. She definitely does look young to me. But you also look the same. So when you said you're 47, that kind of took me by surprise. So you're obviously doing something, something like yourself. So yeah, I, I, eat a, I eat a pomegranate a day. So the research was done, Ashish. Apparently, a pomegranate, the seeds of the pomegranate, if you bite them and eat them or put them in your old Sumit blender, releases omega-5 fatty acid, which has an anti-aging effect. And the pomegranate also releases more nitric oxide, which from your perspective as a cardiology exercise specialist, there's better vasodilation. So a pomegranate a day will probably keep Dr. Ashish away. But talking <laughs> about Dr. Ashish, you've written an amazing book called The Heart Truth. And I, I think that's why I called you in today because um, I recently had a client, a very dear client of mine, uh, the film star Puneet Rajkumar, who passed away because of a heart attack. Now, every one of my clients, every one of my friends, everyone is like in 2020 and 2021, we saw a lot of people, corporate CEOs running on treadmills and collapsing of heart attacks. And I thought, who better than to invite Dr. Ashish, who's the race medical director in the Mumbai Marathon. So if any Mumbai, I mean, any marathon happens and we are running over there, Dr. Ashish is the guy that's saving our life. Uh, hopefully you don't get a heart attack when you run. So Ashish, my first question to you, Doc, is that, uh, is it okay to exercise in 2022? Thanks, Ryan. You know, it's it's actually quite quite sad and quite ironic that over the last year, because we've had these unfortunate events, we are being asked the reverse question. Normally, people should ask, oh, is it bad not to exercise? How can I or my loved one exercise? And today, over the last year, year and a half, people are asking the question in reverse. Um, so give me a couple of minutes to talk on this subject because it's something which, you know, you can't have a one liner on. And ironically, since the last four or five months, I've done probably you know, 10 different podcasts and, and events such as this around this subject. And yours, let me distill it down for you. Exercise is absolutely fabulous. If we could put all the benefits of exercise into a pill, it would probably be the best selling pill ever. Okay. Apart from your heart, stroke, cancer, pretty much every chronic disease known to man, exercise reduces your risk of getting it. And if, God forbid, you have got it, exercise improves your quality of life and reduces your chance of it becoming worse. That's in a, in a nutshell. Okay. Having said that, exercise does not provide immunity against heart attack and death. And this is where people make a mistake. Just because someone is exercising does not mean they cannot have an event. Since we are talking about the subject of, of heart, there are different risk factors which contribute towards a person having a heart attack. Okay, The usual ones, which I'm sure you've spoken about several times in the past, smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heavy weight, genetics, and last is lack of exercise. So obviously, if you're exercising, you're getting rid of one risk factor. But doesn't mean that you cannot have. Now, all these people who unfortunately died young, I cannot comment on what their risk factors were because I do not know it. 
but i just want to say that just because you're fit does not mean you have immunity you have protection but not immunity and that's what people need to understand one one final point when people who are very well known have an event it also makes disproportionate news in the headline when people are yes. exercising and they have an event it makes disproportional news you rarely read in the newspaper somebody sitting at home watching tv has a heart attack doesn't make the news but if the person was in a gym or outdoor exercising it does make the news so, so uh, exercise so, is beneficial so doc you 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 used a very very important point and i i want to ask the maximum number of questions before i let you go i know you're very busy at the hospital um you said immunity doesn't confirm immunity so ryan fernando wants to work out in 2022 doc i want immunity what are the things that i should test for or can i come and visit you at hn reliance hospital and can you get me running on a treadmill what what's what what do i need to do in 2022 so you know you're you're most welcome to visit you've been threatening to do that for the last 5 years but you haven't yet done it but so here's the point i think to start with every adult should know some very basic numbers okay you must know your height and weight i know i'm stating the obvious but there are so many people who don't you must know at least once a year your blood pressure your cholesterol your sugar these are all simple things which can be done with one simple inexpensive blood test and somebody measuring your blood pressure the problem is these are all silent issues all these three big ones blood pressure cholesterol and sugar if your numbers are way high you won't know it until you measure it so if you ask a room full of people do you have you know high cholesterol very few people may put their hand up but then if you ask them how many of you have actually measured it in the last one year again very few people will put their hand up so you can't assume you've got good cholesterol or sugar or blood pressure until you measure it so it this is the minimum testing you need to do once a year now if any of these numbers come high then yes you need to test further something else i would two more points i would add if somebody has a strong family history of heart disease by that i mean some a direct relation mother father brother sister has has died young when i say young say below the age of 60 not just had a heart disease but died young below the age of 60 that would be a sort of a alarm bell in my mind so speak to your doctor he or she may want you to do further tests if you want to embark on vigorous exercise right not just a simple brisk walking program if you want to embark on in vigorous exercise talk to your doctors to see whether additional tests are required or not okay so that's 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 awesome um most of the people that work with shwetambri uh, in terms of fitness all of us are in this young age of 40 to 60 and we feel we are in, invincible we are doing this cholesterol test but they still go they they still do a workout and go down to the pub and then have all that um, unhealthy food and stuff like that what more should they do because i am seeing people coming with esr c reactive protein lipoprotein a lipoprotein b all of this is high uh, hba1c is also high uh, will meeting a cardiologist as a preventive factor and will maybe screening for genetics uh, from that perspective help a client okay so you hit a good point so there are a lot of people who are very fit but they engage in unhealthy behaviors okay so again you may be very fit you may play a great game of tennis or squash or run a quick marathon but you may still be smoking for example so you know you need to take care of your health behavior there's another very well known phrase which you'll identify with which says you cannot outrun a bad diet true so just because you're running mile after mile doesn't mean the you know, people say oh he's so thin he's so fit he can eat anything no you cannot eat anything just because you look fine or if you exercise some of the things you mentioned your lipoprotein small a you know esr c reactive protein a lot of them are markers of what's called inflammation in the body and there are sort of theories that that inflammation is the genesis of a lot of heart disease and other diseases as well so yes under the guidance of a good nutritionist a good doctor further testing would be helpful especially if you have a family history um i don't suggest a specific set of tests which everyone needs to do without talking to their doctor but all the tests you mentioned are for some of the newer risk factors like you mentioned lipoprotein small a homocysteine in the right subset they should be measured 
So I, I have questions coming in live because we're going off Facebook and LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. And somebody, somebody's asked, Doc, what is the difference between a stroke and a heart attack? Okay. So let me tell you the difference between not only a stroke and a heart attack, but also a cardiac arrest and a heart attack that people um, get more confused with. Oh, even because, I don't know the difference between okay. the two. Yeah. So stroke, first of all, the same way a stroke is a brain attack. It's very simple. When we say heart attack is because there are blockages in the heart artery, then a blockage erupts and that causes a heart attack. Similarly, when you have a problem in the brain, the artery, either the art, there are two types of strokes. One is called hemorrhagic when the blood vessel ruptures. That's about five to 10%. The other is when there are blockages, that's called ischemic, which is more common. So stroke in simple words is a brain attack. Okay, same way as a heart attack, there's a brain attack, same risk factors, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, all the usual suspects. Let me tell you the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest, as the name suggests, is when the heart essentially stops beating or stops functioning. So pretty much everyone before, they, before their final breath, so to speak, they're in a cardiac arrest. Now, a heart attack is the commonest cause of a cardiac arrest, but every heart attack does not lead to a cardiac arrest. Okay, one out of three heart attacks tend to be kill people on the spot and they probably lead to the cardiac arrest. At the same time, a heart attack is not the only reason for someone having a cardiac arrest. Let's say you put your hand in a big electrical you know, system and you get electrocuted, you will go into cardiac arrest. A lot of the deaths that we see in young people, and young, I would probably draw the line at 25 to 30, like we saw happen with the Danish footballer during the Ericsson, during the Euro. Yes. And also when recently one Indian cricketer just collapsed. And those, died. those are cardiac arrests happening. The press wrongly reports them as heart attack. Those are not because of cholesterol, BP, etc. and the younger age. They are usually because of some abnormality in the structure of the heart, often genetic in nature. Commonest are what are called cardiomyopathies. Hmm. Uh, or some of the arteries are coming out of a wrong position. It's called the anomalous origin of a coronary artery. Or many of them are unknown where the heart suddenly goes into what's called an arrhythmia, an abnormal heart rhythm. So those lead directly to a heart attack, sorry, a cardiac arrest without a heart attack. Okay. So, so, so doc, if, if somebody has, like you said, no family member or something, or maybe they've done a genetic test and they figured out that they have the cardiomyopathy gene or the atrial fibrillation gene yes. or, or these things that are being identified in today's world, when they come and meet you, what is, what is it that you are looking for in such people? And then what is the advice that you're giving them in terms of, you know, I think the biggest factor today is fear because we have all of this knowledge to test. But then I think people bring upon the disease upon them by just manifesting a, a, a negative event. Yeah. So how do you how do you comfort people? So, how do you so, guide people? You know, in most of so in, let's first talk about the standard, if I may use the word standard heart disease, which is the blockage, you know, the stuff that we most talk about so technically called coronary artery disease that always benefits with exercise. How much exercise at the right time is, of course, what we discuss with the client or with the patient. Now, when you're talking about some of these cardiomyopathies, um, there are some, if, if we see that in, in, in the patient, in the client, rarely do we have to tell them to stop exercise. We often need to tell them that they will have to stop competitive exercise at, a, at the highest level if they've got these cardiomyopathies. But usually, uh, most can do regular recreational exercise. So that's when the expertise comes in to decide who should do everything normally without any stop, who should exercise recreationally but not competitively, and which is that very small subset which should not do anything at all until further workout happens. You know, I'm smiling, Doc, because I think the film stars go into a very competitive mode when they want to morph their body. And they really aggressively push the body. And then there's the diet, which is restrictive. Uh, and then you have various trainers or people giving advice, don't drink water, uh, you know, cut out on sodium so that your skin looks better for the movie shoot. And I think this influences the rest of the population. So you, the, the point I think that I should rephrase is that 
check with a doctor on the intensity that you should work out at competitive or recreational fitness. And to ask you another question, would an exercise wearable that tracks your heart rate help uh, people work out in the correct heart training zone, which puts lesser stress on the heart? I, I think so. I think today wearables have, have really changed the face of the way we measure, the way we quantify the human self. They need to be used sensibly. Now, there are people who also then get drowned in data and get drowned in numbers. So that's the little care you need to take. Um, there's actually a fabulous company, coincidentally based right out of your Bangalore, called Fourth Frontier. And I've been using their devices. They've got a heart rate strap called the Frontier X, which actually not only transmits the uh, heart rate, but it also transmits the ECG. ECG. This is the first of its kind pretty much that I've seen in the world. And I've been looking for years and years, which transmits a live ECG and a very good quality ECG. In the past, whichever things I've worked with, the ECG hasn't been that great. So if you've got a specific heart condition, then exercising with a device like this, which measures the ECG is fantastic. If you don't have a heart condition and you want to use heart rate training just to be more scientific than any wrist-worn device, or, you know, there are several today available and most have a reasonable degree of accuracy can be used. The data needs to be used intent intelligently. You need, you need a right coach, a right guidance as to what your heart rate guidelines should be. And, and you've got to also just make sure that you don't get drowned in data. Often people get drowned in data and they forget the actual thing. You just go out and do something. something. Wait for that perfect workout, the perfect diet. And in between, they don't do anything. So that, that is a problem. Speaking of not doing anything, I got one or two more questions before I let sure. you go. I know you have yes. a busy day. No, no, take, take your time. What prompted you to write this book, The Heart Truth? And I'm going to put the link up for people to buy it because when I read that book, it gave me an eye opener uh, because I did my genetic testing and I've got uh, like 60% of the Indians, according to the gene lab, 60% of the Indians have the predisposition to heart disease. Yeah. So um, I, I was reading your book and you talked about the perfect weight is important. Yeah. If you look at a person and I'm being very cheeky over here, you must be seeing yeah. thousands of patients, right? So somebody comes in and you're just looking at, I think this guy is a probable heart attack person. Are looks deceiving? Like you see a fat man with a visceral fat belly. Uh, what's your experience from an eye perspective to catch a person or you're at a party, I invite you to my new, next year's newer party and we have 500 people over there and Ashish Kondrek goes, heart attack, no heart attack, heart attack, no heart attack. Is it possible that way? Okay, so you're asking two separate questions. I'll answer them one after the other. In terms of, you know, can you judge a book by its cover? In my practice, I've learned that you can often be wrong. We, okay. gen, we normally go by this thing that thin is fit and fat is unfit, which is not true. Of course, if you took a room of 100 people and you divided them by BMI, usually the ones who have the healthy BMI will, as a group, be healthier than the ones who have an unhealthy BMI. But there's a huge variation within that range. I have found that there are a lot of people who are overweight. I'm not talking about completely obese, say BMI 25 to 30 in that zone but who exercise regularly, they're metabolically fit, their sugars, their cholesterol, uh, all their numbers are in great order. It's just that they're carrying a few extra kilos. They're trying their best. They're even maybe eating healthy, but, but you know what? They're still walking around with some weight. And then there are people who look very thin, but just because they're thin doesn't mean that their numbers are perfectly in order. So I, I may not know just by looking at them, but by maybe observing them for half an hour and looking at their plate, I might get a little more uh, inkling, but, but I've been horribly wrong several times. So I don't even want to go there. Shwetambri, do you have any questions <laughs> for doctor? Well, I think the question that I've been getting in the recent past, owing to all those incidents of heart attacks, uh, doctor is really about overtraining. And I just quickly wanted to uh, you know, ask you this question. You know, how, what is overtraining? In a sense, we say that you should work out anything between 30 to, you know, 50 minutes, max an hour a day, and then be active through the day and not just, you know, be sitting around. But I've seen a lot of the ones like between the age of 30 and 40 or 25 to 35, sometimes do like two hours, three hours of rigorous training. And I think at a slightly younger age, you may not feel the burnout as much, but 
do can I relate that to uh, eventually not being good for the heart? Okay, so you asked, uh, asked a great question. Uh, let me quickly answer Ryan's earlier question. What prompted me to write the book? So yeah. in, in my in my cardiac rehab practice, um, we used to see, you know, I must have seen over over ten thousand people come and go, and I decided that a lot of people they have hundreds of questions, but the questions tend to be very similar. So I wrote the book in a very colloquial fashion. These are my experiences of dealing with my patients. And they usually have the same questions. So I'll try to, in a conversational style, address about four or 500 of the commonest questions that, that they've had um, over time. And I found that that was very useful. So now when people come in, I say, if you like, you can read the book that will answer a lot of the questions um, that you have. And it was, I promised myself before I turned 40, I will write a book. So that's uh, that was the reason for the book and i'll run a sub 145 half marathon so both those promises have been kept and that was wow. exactly 10 years ago um to answer shwetambri's question okay this question of over exercising and over training is a great question let's look at it in two ways we can do what's called acute or chronic. Acute means over-exercising like in a single session, right? A session mm. of two hours, three hours, how much you go, right? That's an immediate acute overtraining. The second is chronic. Chronic meaning over months, over years, someone who's running 100 kilometers plus week after week for you know many years, um, someone who trains in the gym two hours a day for you know week after week, year after year. Um, so if someone builds up them, builds themselves up sensibly, right? Starting with the very standard 30 to 60 minutes, moderate intensity exercise, four or five days a week. Um, and you keep building up. Rule of thumb is not doing more than 10% increment over your previous week. If you do that over time, a person, the human body is capable of great achievement. Okay, I used to once growing up think that, oh my God, 42 kilometers is impossible. For the last now seven years, I've been doing one full marathon every year. But the human body can build it up. So yeah. that isn't a problem. But if I wake up, a lot of people are the weekend warriors. They're not doing much. And then suddenly on a Sunday, they decide today we'll go and ride for four hours. Today we will, you know, run for two hours. That is a problem. Okay, so when you push yourself, so... Overtraining is pushing an unprepared body for the task at hand. That's mm -hmm. very important. There are two people. Somebody may run one and a half hours and that may be overtraining because that person never run more than half an hour before in their life. Or someone may run four hours, but they've been doing between three and three and a half hours for the last six months. So for yeah. that person, that four hour run wasn't overtraining to the position they had built themselves up with. But the guy who ran one and a half hours who's used to half an hour is overtraining. Why? The guy who ran 45 minutes when he's never run before is overtraining. Yeah. Okay. So acute overtraining has got to be seen in light of the conditioning of the person. Okay. That's important. Chronic overtraining. This is where it gets interesting. Is there something like too much over time? So earlier the answer was there really isn't too much. What they're now discovering that people who are putting in large volumes of endurance training over many years, they sometimes tend to have higher amounts of what's called atrial fibrillation. They mm. sometimes have a little more scarring on the heart muscle. Having said that, we've still not figured that is that more dangerous in any way. So the jury is out there that is there something like the ill effects of chronic overtraining, number one. And if there is, what's the magic line? Now, please let me emphasize, these are people who have been doing like on an average 40, 50, 70 full marathons, ultra marathons. So by no means the average person that you and I see in our practice. So there's no need for people to panic. But there yeah. is of late, last five, seven years, scientific light looking at this. Okay, so that question is under study. As of now, we haven't defined that. Sure. Thanks, Doc. You're on sure you. yeah. Sorry, uh, here, there's a question from uh, uh, a person watching us, uh, Mr. Patel asking with relationship to triglycerides, 
even after a safe diet, no outside food and exercise, still my triglycerides, visceral fat levels often shoot up. What may be the reason? Okay, so, um, you know, the diet part I leave to you, but just one quick point, just because you don't eat outside food, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're True. eating healthy food, right? The, the average Indian diet, especially the vegetarian diet, tends to be very high in carbohydrate. Uh, and I'm not an anti-carb person like the fad is today, but the point is the average Indian diet tends to be very high in simple sugars, just a lot of rice, bread, chapatis in the diet as opposed to vegetables. So though, you know, the person may be vegetarian, the amount of vegetables, which is great for you, is not eaten in large quantities. In my experience, Indians tend to have high triglycerides and low HDL, along with that visceral fat. It's that classic insulin resistance syndrome, metabolic syndrome, syndrome X, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, I have found that reducing the simple carbohydrates, simple sugars in the diet definitely helps. Um, exercise helps reducing visceral fat and triglycerides. So I think, I think if you're consistent over time, you will definitely get benefits uh, in reducing triglycerides with a little bit of weight loss, regular, not just exercise as Shwetambri said, also including physical activity as part of your daily life. Okay, there are people who go to the gym one hour a day and spend 23 hours being inactive. So that's also not good. So being physically active, exercising, uh, reducing simple sugars in the diet, all of these will go towards reducing triglycerides and visceral fat as well. Wonderful. Doc, I think we have taken more than time that you have no, taken. You are no. required back at the hospital. Thanks. Thank you for Thanks. joining us today and wonderful, a million, million thanks. Wonderful. Happy New Year. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Talk Doctor. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Doc. Thank you. So, Shwe, we had Dr. Ashish contractor, and um, I, I guess if I've never run a marathon and he's run a marathon, and he was saying if somebody suddenly decides to run a marathon, never run in their life, that's me. That's me, Ryan Fernando. <laughs> I run on my treadmill. Uh, I do I do 11 or 12 on the treadmill for 30 seconds, and then I walk for about 20 minutes, and then I sprint again. Uh, but today's session is all about uh, the people who we have to convince Shwe to dance. You are... Uh, a dance instructor, you are a physical fitness trainer, you are a CrossFit athlete. If somebody came up to you, Shwe, and asked you, where do I start? Or they start and everyone makes this New Year's resolution and they fail within 20, 25 days. What would be your advice? Start big and push your body because I see this happen in the gym. Trainers get enthusiast, enthusiastic, people get enthusiastic, but by uh, February, most of the crowd that has joined us has disappeared. You just have the regulars. Yeah. <laughs> so what's, what's your advice? You've gone through many new years and what would you advise? Yeah. For anyone and everyone, like irrespective of what age they belong to, right? I think the fundamental will always be the same. First, learn to get your body moving, right? And only then incorporate other types of activities. And when I say learn to you know, get your body moving, I just say start with walking a lot more often. That is your fundamental. Your body is designed to move. And if you're not able to walk enough steps in a given day, then maybe incorporating other activities, I'm not saying is wrong, but maybe it'll be too soon. Yes, you can start off with yoga. You can start off with Pilates. You can start with, you know, just a little bit of jogging, running, dancing, especially for people who love music and dance. All of this is great, just 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day. But the most fundamental is moving your body more often. So my recommendation to everyone is start moving. Uh, if you are doing 2,500 steps a day because you have a sedentary lifestyle, you're working a lot of hours sitting in front of the laptop, step it up to maybe 3,500, start slow, or maybe 5,000. And then slowly over weeks, you'll see you're able to push it to 6,000, 7,000, right? Start with that. But otherwise, apart from moving and walking, uh, my go-to is always 20 to 30 minutes of activity and choose your favorite activity. That's the second important thing. When you choose your favorite activity, you will be consistent. And then when you're consistent after like a month or so, you will see results. And when you see results, 
you're excited to continue that journey. And then that 20, 30 minutes will become 40 minutes, 50 minutes. You know, you end up spending a lot more time. And I have a lot of these examples, people who detest exercising, you know, we convince them to just do 15 minutes a day not asking even a minute more right and today uh, you know this group of people who started with 15 minutes do like 45 50 minutes and literally change their body composition you know become leaner stronger uh, far lower fat percentage so on and so forth so pick an activity that you love doing and it can be absolutely anything it can be a sport right i do not say that sport and exercises are two similar things but both let you move right even sports is fun a lot of us love sports and you know we don't do too much sports because we don't have time but pick a sport you love pick any activity that you can do consistently for a month or pick a trainer so there are various ways ryan if one wants to really start a personal trainer can do wonders you have been personal training for years now yeah and I, I think I, I, that that's a point I, i'm sorry i'm interrupting you but this is a point yeah. i think for all our listeners to listen in and for the fitness industry, uh, people feel that if I invest money in a trainer, uh, it's it's going to be expensive. Like most yeah. gym memberships in India, around twelve thousand rupees, a thousand rupees a month on an average. If you go to a high class gym, maybe it's two thousand rupees a month. So people think, oh, I'm spending two thousand rupees a month for the gym or the exercise or the coach or the yoga instructor, but the personal training cost is, let's say, anywhere starting from 5,000 to 40,000 rupees a month, yeah. right? Uh, and let me share my experience. I've been personal training for now 10 years with a, a personal trainer, and I had the same um, I had the same fundamental principle that I'm going to be spending, you know, five, 8,000 rupees a month, and those days it used to be the EMI of my car, <laughs> right? Now, my uh, input to everyone uh, out there listening in today is that whilst you can change your car, you can't change your body. Your body. So your investment with a trainer, which is a post I put up yesterday, um, I, have, I had Mr. Vishnu Pai who recruited a personal trainer at the age of 72. With one year of personal training, his metabolic age, he was 72 birth certificate, and 73 metabolic, his body age came down to 60. Wow. 13 years of metabolic age down because he lost about 11 kgs of only fat and retained all his muscle because of the personal trainer. So at 72, yeah. the personal trainer didn't allow him to go over or extra. Now, Mr. Vishnu Pai earns about one CR per year, one crore a year. So that personal trainer just gave him 13 crores more of additional income. So if you begin to look at your investment in exercise, start with the thought to work out, then start with the thought to do an activity, then go to a place to do that activity, then engage with a person or friends. And speaking of friends, Shwe, do you think when people join together as friends or a group of people, there's more chance of success of them continuing in, in the year? Yeah. 100%. We've noticed even at Cult, right, group workouts are far more successful or a partner workout like you do with your personal trainer, right, are far, far more successful because uh, people feel accountable. Like even in, when I work with one trainer as a group exercise, I've built a community or a family, you know, who actually check on me when I don't show up consecutively for two, three days. Hey, you know, why haven't you been coming? So yes, the number of people who are become consistent are far more when they work out as a buddy or as a personal trainer or as a group. Definitely. Shwetamri, what's the best that you've seen from a couch potato joining an exercise program? And what's the worst you've seen? Hmm. Uh, what's the best? So, you know, uh, I think from a couch, for a, for a couch potato or for someone who's got very sedentary lifestyle, uh, well, I've seen how they just jump into exercise or let's say we open in new new cities every year right or, or every other month at least we were so people would really get excited about oh cult is in our city and they would like all come in for that first class a lot of these guys who've never probably exercised before right in front of my eyes i've seen people just like drop you know like 20 minutes into the workout they just drop they're sweating and they drop not because of anything else, because their body is not used to it, right? And then what, what I typically do is I keep like a candy and I immediately give them a candy and then 
they then like feeling a little better you know so this is like the worst because nobody has educated them key exactly how that transition should be how to start slow then moderate and then go to that advanced level right but people normally who start off with like you know listen to the trainer do shorter duration of workouts um, and probably like i do, said again do, 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 do you get do you get this statement i was an athlete in college i am now 47 years old but i was an athlete in college do you get that statement yeah from my father <laughs> <laughs> i mean fortunately for me i i i have to listen to him because he's a super active man uh, except what happened recently but otherwise he's been active all his life and the only reason he's able to survive his diabetes that stent in his heart and all of that uh, is because of his activity every day 2 hours of consistent you know walking and basic exercise never a day not even a sunday he believes in not waking up in the morning and doing it so yeah once an athlete uh, always an athlete i guess but we kind of lose those years because we're also caught up with life and profession but it's really not hard ryan for any of us to just be active i keep telling people that even if you don't go and exercise it's okay if you can get up every 5 minutes every hour for 5 minutes every hour walk around just around your room or something you're sorted right just moving your body more often is what we really need Wonderful. i think we have two questions here yes uh, so one question is uh, what is genetic yeah. testing so uh, jyoti asked this question so in the new age world when we work with elite athletes we work with celebrities um i am at qua nutrition clinics doing what is known as nutrigenomics nutrigenomics is the science of taking a saliva sample opening up your dna dna is a software code in the human body and a certain lab will do the checking of that software code so they can check for what they can check for the color of your eyes they can check whether you're going to go bald they're going to, they can even check whether you're going to have a heart attack risk and there are huge things from the diet point of view like for example i checked for gluten sensitivity now my dna says that i'm gluten sensitive but my gut does not say i'm gluten sensitive and this is something very interesting that i want to share with people about gene testing uh, we have recently started a cardiac dietary rehabilitation division so we are helping shwetambri thousands of people who have high cholesterol as dr ashish said a uh, people who have high lipoprotein a lipoprotein b homocysteine c reactive protein these are all inflammatory markers with your cholesterol and uh, your uh, diabetes which is hba1c if it's high so such people are more susceptible uh, to metabolic disease and incidences of uh, heart disease so when we do a genetic test you get a crystal ball gazing i'm like an astrologer that's saying there's a chance that in the future you may have an issue why don't you keep this uh, rudraksha so this rosary or this uh, uh, you know these beads with you and start praying but for me those beads and all are all related to your nutrition from your perspective your beads are all about exercise so genetic testing is doing uh, a dna analysis and seeing do you have a gene that says it's thumbs up in your body 50 50 or thumbs down very interestingly i am gluten intolerant for the last 8 years i gave up bread wheat biscuits pastry so i only buy gluten free stuff which is from wheat barley and rye and last week when we launched the cardiac rehab division shwetamri this is very interesting we found a study that had rats because rats have about a 98% genetic profile to us and it has a mm. short shelf life so you can do multiple generations of rat so they they caused plaque to form in the rats by feeding them a very high fat diet mm. okay and then they divided them into two groups in one group of rats they gave them gluten which is found in wheat and in one group they gave them no gluten and they found that the plaque which is those blockages in the artery were much more stickier in the rats who were on a gluten based diet that is wheat was there in their diet and the diet that did not have the wheat which did not have the gluten those rats had nearly 60% lesser incidences of plaque formation plaque. which led to sudden deaths in the rats even rats get heart attacks unfortunately so the perspective over here for me was i could do a dna test 
which has got nothing related to my heart from a nutrition point of view and figure out whether I should or should not avoid. So I call this elite living wherein when you, when I come to your gym, Shwe, I'm buying a lovely pair of shoes. Whereas we could always work out barefoot. Barefoot. So the fashionability, the knowledge is to wear something that's fashionable, but people don't understand the fashion is actually science. And in nutrition, the fashionability could be to check your genetics to figure out what it is that can work. Another one is a caffeine gene. Shwe, do you remember your caffeine gene? Should you drink coffee or should you not drink coffee? No, so my genetic test says I should not be drinking coffee. In fact, my gut test also said, kind of say no to coffee, but I love coffee. And I remember our last conversation, you said, uh, let me see how I can give you that one coffee. <laughs> yeah, so, so when I'm doing your nutrition counseling, here's the perspective. Research has shown people who are not caffeine responders as per their DNA should take only one cup of coffee a day. Anything more raises your blood pressure and increases your risk element of heart attack or stroke. So it's a very, very interesting thing that you're very fit and everything. I'm only operating from a perspective that I have to always convince you that, you know, maybe just one cup of coffee would be good enough, not more than that. <laughs> cool. We have another. No, I think I think I, I must add here something else that I wanted to talk to you about the genetic test was it, my genetic test also shows the fact that uh, my fat loss doesn't necessarily always come from um, just ex exercise, exercise, right? Because I exercise a lot and not a lot, but very consistently, and I do see a lot of gains from it. But I keep going back to Ryan because I know through my genetic test that just by exercising. I'm not going to get to that goal, you know, of maintaining certain fat percentage. I need food intervention. I need to eat better, eat smarter, eat right. right? So, that's, so that's a very important point in the gene testing and the sports part uh, we did for you, Shwetambri, uh, where we checked your endurance, your power, your cartilage damage, your fatigue. Like I have yeah. the fatigue gene, so I fatigue very fast. So when I do my workouts, I tend to take a little longer break between two sets. Yeah. In your case, uh, which was very surprising, uh, and this is for everyone out there, people assume that exercise is going to be the absolute barp of fat burning, but you may not have the genetics or the software code in you. So basically it's like this, Shwetamri doesn't have a pen drive in her that she can connect, which says, okay, Mr. Exercise, start burning all the fat. That yeah. DNA is missing. So she has to do constant physical work. Whereas there are certain people who can do high intensity activity and that just switches, switches on the fat burning uh, uh, mechanism in the human body. So that's, uh, that's found out right now. And this is something that can be done. Uh, we've got a few more questions. Uh, Miss Goel yeah, is asking, these days we're seeing high uric acid and high creatinine in many runners. What could be the reason? Supplements or is it normal? First things first. In India, we are predominantly a vegetarian country. People assume that they can get a lot of uric acid from a high protein diet. And when vegetarians decide to take up exercise, they decide to eat more amount of dals, which inadvertently may increase your uric acid. So either the, 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 the vegetarian dals may increase your uric acid, number one. I've seen people who are pure vegetarians increase their milk and uh, uric acid levels go up. Number two, vegetarians assume they're vegetarians, but you are actually non-vegetarian when you're an exercise person. How? You cannibalize your own muscle. There's anabolism and there's catabolism. Anabolism is to build muscle. Catabolism is to break down muscle. So when you are on a low protein diet, you eat into your own vegetarian muscles. So when you break down your muscles, my assumption is that your uric acid, which is a byproduct of the purines metabolism, that's a breakdown of DNA of animal protein, and animal protein includes your own muscle, as well as the creatine that is stored in your muscle, and that could be why it's going up. I don't believe it's supplements, but sometimes, yes, people tend to douse with more supplements. Uh, it's not the right element to go forward. And then Joshi asked in the same breath, uh, even after eating 2.2 kgs of protein and doing weight, regular weight training, I'm still yeah. losing muscle mass along with fat. Maybe you have a gene like I have, which is uh, Shwetambri knows me to be working out really crazy and heavy and I have no big muscles to show for it. <laughs> Certain of us uh, do not have the gene which is responsible for uh, building muscle. 
and 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 I I learned this wherein, in I think in Spain or Italy they began to remove this muscle, uh, they remove this gene from the cows, uh, that uh, when they remove the gene it caused an overgrowth of muscle. So some of us have a genetic predisposition to be leaner, you know, and no matter how much of protein, you know, guys. I get all the free protein in the world. I call up fast enough, fast enough will tell me, send me a truckload of protein. I used to work for body fuels. I used to work for Amway. I had all the free protein available in the world. I should look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and say, I'll be back. But it's not protein that builds muscle. It is the stimulus of weight training. It is the stimulus of weight training and the correct diet. So Joshi, if you're not getting results, then maybe just putting protein into your body might be a wrong thing because you might be setting yourself yeah. up for more protein from a heart attack perspective by increasing your inflammatory markers. So there's a lot we're doing from the microbiome, which is your gut testing. And when you put the wrong foods in, they create a lot of inflammatory markers which go into your blood and then your C-reactive protein goes up and you increase the C-reactive or the inflammatory markers start beating up cholesterol. So cholesterol gets more stickier. Sugar starts increasing because you want to eat more and more because even protein causes an insulin spike. Yes. Um, so Shwetamri, I don't know if I told you this, yeah. but I had put a continuous glucose monitoring device on my hand last month. Yeah. And I was shocked to find out something like a cup of rice put my uh, sugar really high up there. So maybe Joshi, you want to check out uh, a continuous glucose monitoring device and see, you know, how you want to go forward. I also want to quickly add for Sarvesh Joshi Ryan that in his training, you know, he can probably change the way his weight training is being done. Right. He can probably look at, you know, more hypertrophy model. He can, you know, look at doing certain type, like don't do very lightweight training or don't do extremely heavy. Do in between, but for like eight to 12 reps. So maybe he can change the way his weight training is being done to achieve, you know, certain, maybe get his muscle mass to a better number. You know, that can also make a huge difference. Uh, Anik is asking, I think Shwetambri, this is for you. I follow low intensity exercises, brisk walking yes. and strength training to reduce my fat, but I feel I need to add more variety to it as it gets boring. Which exercises would you recommend for fat loss? Yeah, fab. So you love, it seems like you like brisk walking, right? Uh, so I would say continue that because that's something that's worked very well for me. Doing about 10, 12, 15,000 steps a day is like the best way to do uh, get a lot of fat loss. I'm not sure if you enjoy dance based workout, but dance fitness personally has not only worked for me, but for a lot of my clients, it has worked very well for fat loss. Boxing has worked extremely well. And these are all the cardio kind of exercises I'm talking about uh, is great for fat loss. And then you know, there is running. All of these are great for fat loss. But I would say mix it up with light weights, right? If you don't want to, since I read that you're doing low intensity, even with weights, picking up lighter weights, you can do low intensity exercises, very basic stuff, you know, focus on your squats and lunges and some core workout just with your weights. Just adding a little bit of resistance training can contribute a lot towards fat loss. So just alternate your cardio and strength days. Keep it low intensity, not a problem. You have your brisk walking, taking care of the big chunk of the fat there. Uh, but yeah, mix it up, do different things. I, I, I keep mixing it up, you know, the whole week, different types of exercises, conditioning and strength training. It's fun and you get the desired results. How often should we have a cheat day? Once a week or once a month? How many calories can we have on a cheat day? You know, uh, Viber, this is a brilliant question and... Uh, I think mathematically, it's very difficult as a nutritionist to have my personal supremacy on a diet. Even when I give a nutrition plan, the calories are subject to a plus or minus 20% uh, because of the way the food is grown, because of your katori at home, the way and the methodology of preparation. Whilst I might tell you to make a certain type of vegetable sabzi, your servant decides to put uh, four tablespoons of oil in that sabzi. So the calorie content does always change. So what I feel Vibhav is that a cheat meal is based more from a psychological perspective rather than a physiological perspective. So over the years, I've found this mantra that works very well. I personally love having a bit of chocolate 
or I personally love having um, a Coke every now and then, which is the, the aerated beverage. So like you might find me at a leading restaurant with uh, uh, a cup of aerated beverage. I, I actually just take a little bit, 100 ml. Now, what's my logic over here? I know that the cheat meal is psychological, so I portion control the cheat meal. I try and do it frequently. But the rest of my meals, I'm very, very focused on Monday to Friday or Saturday, the breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever I'm doing, I'm very specific. And I keep the consistency on my workout or movement to know that I'm not consuming more than I'm actually uh, requiring. And, and this is food for thought. And Shwetambri, I'm, I'm actually going to be working on something which I'll invite you on board later with, which is I want to build the world's first BMI carbon fruit footprint, uh, making you feel guilty scale. <laughs> Think about it. The heavier you are on this planet, the more your carbon footprint. So forget about heart yeah. attack. Forget about everything else. If you're a, if you're a, <laughs> if you're a warrior, I predict in this 2022 that there will be a shortly a day where you will step onto the wing scale at the airport along with your baggage. And then yeah. uh, Vistara will not tell you me, Mr. Fernando, you are overweight. I'll be looking at my baggage. I'll be looking at myself. And I'm saying, did you check the guy behind me? He's like 200 kgs with his baggage combined. So very, very important. A cheat meal is psychological. It's not physiological. So people think they will let go for one cheat meal. There's no physical activity on that Saturday or Sunday. So Vibhav, if I were you, I would do camping, I would do, uh, I would do my CrossFit, I would do my dancing at the nightclub uh, and just burn a whole lot of calories and um, keep the portion small in the cheat meal. Uh, he asked another question to you, Shwetamri, yeah. which is, is it okay for obese people to run? If yes, is running on the treadmill advice ev every day or alternate days? Yeah, absolutely. I think obese people uh, should start with walking move to brisk walking, you know, easy jog, and then go into like a little more faster running. Treadmills can be used. Outdoor running also can be done. There is honestly no problem using treadmills. I would just say that, uh, you know, for someone who's obese and is sedentary and they'll have some sort of joint pain and all of that, that'll happen. And that'll happen irrespective, whether they're running on the treadmill or running outside on the road, which is why I'm saying start slow, but yes, it'll be great if they can start, you know, jogs and walks and brisk walks and running. It's a fabulous way. It's easy. It's simple, not dependent on anything and good to start losing that extra fat in the body. You know, Shweta Amri, I work with a lot of orthopedic surgeons. My pop-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon. And, um, you know, you get to listen to the physios, the, the knee experts, ACL reconstruction. Yeah. When a person runs, the knee impacts at 4.5 times its body weight. So yeah. let's assume somebody's 100 kgs, starting weight of 100 kgs, 400 kgs on that knee when they mm. run. Correct. So the ideal perspective that has always been told to me from the orthopedic community uh, is that uh, if somebody's at about 100 kgs and they need to be at 60 kgs, they're carrying an extra 40 kgs. 40 kgs. So uh, the, the thumb rule is if you walk 15,000 steps a day, you can get a 2 kg fat loss per month. Yes. So Vaibhav, I would say that two kgs fat loss per month by walking 15,000 yeah. steps a day, no load on that. If you want to run, run in a swimming pool. All, all people who have BMI above 24 should, in my opinion, run in a swimming pool to save your yeah. knees so that you can run even when you're a 70 year old at 60 kgs. Absolutely. So th that would be my advice to, 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 to Vibov. And uh, um, if you, if your family is a, a born runners, then you should have no joint deterioration and stuff like that. So then please do <laughs> run. But if you come from uh, uh, Ryan Fernando's family, where half the family is on walking sticks and all, and you have joint deterioration, then you yeah. want to be focusing on cardiovascular exercises, not using your legs to run, but doing dance workouts or continuous workouts or going working yeah go, keeping your your rest between workouts and stuff like that in the gym and stuff like that and, and uh, shwetamri that's one of the reasons why i never turned up at your dance classes because <laughs> I, I realized i would dance i love to dance but then my knees are gone the next day even as a lightweight so yeah. you know you have no, to you figure shouldn't. this out you, you have exactly. to figure this out uh, and so i think uh, as experts when we are working with you 
it's always an individualized basis to your diet, individualized basis to, to your exercise. So get in touch with your expert and ask them what we want to do. There's a nutrition question from Manisha. Hey, Manisha, how are you doing? Is honey, lemon, warm water in morning helpful for weight loss? This has been around for centuries in Ayurveda. Very interestingly, I'll share you the scientific perspective, which you probably won't find on any internet channel. I was recently received a product from Canada, which for, for people who have gut problems to heal the lining of their stomach, uh, you need to boost something known as N-acetyl glucosamine. Now, N-acetyl glucosamine forms mucin, which is you can call like the scaffolding inside your intestine, which builds the protection and the integrity, which allows for better absorption of food. When you combine glucose, glutamine and fructose, you produce the body's natural N-acetyl glucosamine. When you take lemon and you take honey and warm water, you're providing a certain raw material early morning. So Manisha, what I would recommend to you, find an amino acid called glutamine, put about three grams of it in your honey and lemon water and take it early morning because it heals your gut lining. And when you heal your gut lining, metabolism absorption gets better. You don't need to eat trashy food and your body gives you feedback that you're absorbing better. So even when you eat a crappy meal, which is high calorie, the body kind of stops you. But when your gut is ravaged or damaged, the feedback signal of satiety to the brain is shortened. So there's a lot of wisdom, ancient wisdom. And for everyone who's listened in this far, here's a tip. The pharmacy, pharmacy industry doesn't tell you how to reduce cholesterol minus drugs. For all of you who have higher cholesterol but are not yet on statins, please take a statin if your doctor has advised it because it saves your life. In fact, when my clients come to me, I say, do not remove your statins. Continue your statins till we get it low down enough for your doctor to give permission to remove it. But what's the natural way to drop down cholesterol? Five grams of organic amla powder every morning. Take a teaspoon, toss it into your mouth, have a glass of water, five almonds, and if you can have an apple a day and two tablespoons of oats a day, you do these four things. Amla, you have um, uh, you have the uh, apple, apple. And you have the almonds, oats. five almonds, and you have two tablespoons of oats a day. This will reduce your bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, and boost your HDL. I significantly have seen it happen. I've given away a celebrity Qua Nutrition cl Clinic secret. My dietitian company, so why are you giving away all the secrets? Nobody will come to us for a diet plan. But I do genuinely believe that everyone listening in, you know, my first car was a second-hand thousand, right? And as we move through life, we upgrade our vehicles. As you move through life, you'll upgrade your diet, you'll upgrade your workout. So I'm saying to you, you cannot change this body of yours. It's not replaceable. I can't make Ryan Fernando Skoda to Ryan Fernando Mercedes to Ryan Fernando Rolls Royce. I can only make Ryan Fernando be as best as possible in terms of diet and exercise. So these are small, small things that you can start doing. Be aware. And Shwetamri, I know you've been my client for so long, but if I come home today and have dinner with you, um, will there be organic tomatoes in your house? Uh, I just bring my vegetables from a farm, that's all. <laughs> okay, good. So we are hoping that this farm is organic. So Shwe, yeah. <laughs> furthering to your counsel, let's imagine you're in my counseling room today. The reason I want organic is because it reduces the pesticide and chemical and yeah. insecticide load on my liver and kidney. That could be another reason people are getting morbidly obese. Another tip, and I think the e-commerce apps are going to hate us for this, your Zomato and Swiggy are the devil in the disguise for not looking great. I repeat, Zomato and Swiggy are the devil in disguise for not making you look and feel great. I'll tell you why. Last night, I wanted to eat a high protein meal. I was too lazy to go to my fridge which had organic food. What did I do? Swiggy, chick, 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 press a button. 45 minutes later, I had something that was unhealthy. I wanted to have sushi, which was healthy, but I ended up being distracted by the app and oh, this discount and all. So I think in 2022, those of you who are on the borderline of 
I'm fed up with my life. I want to change my life. I, I, I want to do something. I'm depressed. I'm, I'm not feeling happy. I wish I could be a celebrity. I wish I could be a millionaire. The one tip that I would give you to start feeling better, to start looking up is stop ordering from outside. The reason behind this is I will tell you many, many years ago, I ran a very successful brand that uh, provided healthy meals to the corporates. But the guys that prepared those foods, no matter how much, I remember yelling and screaming in the kitchen and it was like, you're only a nutritionist, you're not even a chef, was the way they treated food. No matter what the principles, no matter what the restaurant owner wants, the people preparing your food are cooks. They will not wash the cabbage, which has got all the insecticides and pesticides before cutting it and putting it in your food. This is what happens in a, in a, in a commercial kitchen. Check, 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 check. Not washed, thrown directly into the pan. So even if little insecticides and pesticides had to be washed off, people, restaurant guys are gonna, gonna assassinate me on the internet for this. They're gonna say, how do you know? Have you been in our kitchen? I am telling you, if I take a confession from every person that runs a kitchen who has cut that vegetable, ha sab, wo to bada sab hai na, gaadi mein aata hai, restaurant chalata hai, usko kya pata hai, hum toda salary deta hai aur baad mein uh, humko bolta hai, ye karne ka, wo karne ka. This happened in our kitchen also. So we had to incentivize them to wash sink one, sink two, sink three. So pesticides are more in your ordered food from outside. Number two, dalda, palm oil has huge organoleptic properties on your taste buds. There was this daba in, I don't know where, I don't, I don't know, it was in Pune or something. So the cardiologist convinced that guy to prepare his pao bhaji with a different oil instead of using dalda. Overnight, apparently people started disappearing because the taste changed. <laughs> so, so the fact of the matter is when you use palmitic acid, which is the most aggressive for plaque formation. I repeat. Yeah, yeah. So when I go out, people are always looking at me like, Ryan, why are you not very happy eating out? I'm thinking, dalda to laga diya bhai. Isko to 150 k rupees per kg. Bloody olive oil is 600 rupees a kg. Which guy will use olive oil? Which guy will use cold press sesame oil? Which guy will use cold press uh, um, uh, groundnut oil? So I'm, I'm just appealing to people that in 2022, if you have money, hire a chef. If you don't have that much of money, five of you get together, have a party, invite a chef to cook for you and buy all the produce and make it organic and tell the chef don't use Dalda. By the way, speaking of Dalda, I take a blood test of omega-6 and omega-3 and I send it to Norway to check your inflammation rate. So if you have a heart disease, I can, for 9,000 bucks, prick your finger, send the blood test to Norway. I did it, Shwetamri. Mm. Yeah. And so, I have to make a public confession. The Zomato and Swiggy convinces me to have my cheat meal from outside every week. My palmitic oil levels were high. Yeah. So to bring it down, I asked the Swedish guy, what's your decision? Stop eating this trans fat, stop eating this palm oil. Uh, and you will watch your uh, omega-6 and omega-9 automatically drop, which are the inflammatory markers. Right. Them, yeah. there have, are there a lot of more questions? Uh, let's Let's just take four, five more. I'm just finding any exercise yes. questions. Yeah, there is one on uh, Poonam asking, does cardio make you lose muscle? So very quickly, Poonam, uh, yes, that's the answer. But you need cardio. You can't do without cardio, right? I'll give you my own example. I did ca cardio for a living, right? That was my pr profession, teaching a lot of dance, fitness, and et cetera. So when I didn't combine it with strength training, I ended up hurting myself because of extreme muscle loss. And now, over the last many years, since I've incorporated a lot of strength training and alternated well with cardio, I have zero injuries, zero aches and pains and et cetera. And, you know, I have good fat loss, decent, you know, muscle gain and all of that. So if you're doing only cardio, yes, you'll lose a good amount of fat. But after, after losing that fat, it will start eating into your muscle. So you need a combination of cardio and weights. Right? Yeah, then there is a question again from Urvashi. You want me to read it for you? Start a strength training. I find it very difficult to consume proteins in every meal. I tried whey and I got UTI. Can vegetarian protein be included with animal protein? 
Wow. You know what? Before I take this question, Shweta Amri, I know you have a busy schedule. I want to ask you, what are you doing for the New Year's in terms of cult fit before I let you go? I'm going to take all of these questions offline with everybody. But yeah. uh, I heard something about a belly burn. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds quite corny, you know, <laughs> like belly burn. Okay, very quickly again. So this is a program that's going to start. It's a four week uh, workout program with me. The program is called Belly Burn. Season one was last year. Season two starts day after tomorrow, which is Monday. We wanted to start, you know, the new where, year. Where do I where do month. I find it? Where do I Google up for it? Everything online. You just have to download the Cultfit app, and the workout is there on the Cult app. So it's a C U L T F I T app, Cultfit app. Yes, okay. Cultfit app. Yeah, Cultfit app, and the also we have a one month free trial period for everybody to use who who's never used the app before. So most probably this entire program can probably be used by people for free. It's a four week program. And guess what? It's not just about working out Monday to Friday, you know, with me. You also have recoveries planned on Saturday, which is a proper recovery workout. And no fat burn can happen without eating right. So we have a meal plan, which is obviously designed by Ryan Fernando and Qua, right? So it's a combination of a workout again body weight optional dumbbells i've given options for dumbbells as well it's a 45 minute workout every day you can choose any time you want right it's not like i'm doing it on zoom or anything 5 a.m all the way up until like 10 30 11 p.m it's available for you to consume and the meal plan which is with ryan is also there and uh, it's on the app so you just have to download it and follow it through for the entire four weeks there's also these challenges where 15,000 steps a day for, you know, intermediate advanced athletes for beginners. It's just about six to 8,000 steps a day. And it's for all beginners, intermediate advanced, because we've scaled it down, scaled it up based on what your intensity is. If you're starting out, restarting all of that. And uh, in belly burn one, just very quickly, Ryan, we've seen great successes. We had over 10,000 people doing it and we saw huge success rate in terms of inch loss. And that's what we look at. We don't ask people to really step on the weighing scale. We say, take a measure, measuring tape and tell me the difference. Are your old clothes fitting you better? Are your clothes fitting you better? Stuff like that. So we've seen huge success. Of course, I think four weeks consistently working out, eating right, anybody will see success. So yeah, if you feel like working out with me, we start Monday. So Shwe, this is awesome. I think uh, every year we start off with something new and we get 10,000 people. Let's hope this year that you get a million people and I wish you all the best. I'll be seeing you in your next diet session at my clinic. Uh, yes, your nutrition plan is almost getting ready. So Shwetamri said in December itself, you know what, I need to get started in the new year. Uh, I don't think she needs a nutrition plan from an aesthetic point of view, which is why most of you were like, can I lose this fat or can I, can I get these love handles off? Shwetamri is an elite athlete. Her perspective is, how do I get anti-aging? How do I get more out of my workout? How do I get better energy during the day? So nutrition perspective is not only fat burning from the belly area, which is for most people, a big chunk of your thought process. But I would say, look beyond that. You're going to live yeah. on this planet for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, 70 years. Maybe if you're a youngster watching this video, uh, you can't replace your vehicle. You can only take it to the rice servicing garage. One of those servicing garages is cult fit where Shwetambri practices or any exercise place that you love. And the yeah. other garage where you can take it for maintenance is the nutritionist who can help you eat scientifically instead of you eating out of love and culture from your parents. Shwetambri, I won't hold you back. I've got a lot of nutrition questions. I'm going to take that. I know your, yeah. I know your little guy must be somewhere around there, and and a little needs, girl, <laughs> little little, uh, little girl needs you over there, and um, it's a Saturday. No, but I just want to say, I, I I want to tell everyone who's you know listening and watching that um, exercise and nutrition go hand in hand. There is no way you can separate the two. Even for someone like me, I know for a fact that I've got decent metabolism. When I eat a slice of cake, I know it's not just getting stored. Some of it is actually burning away, right? I know that I have that confidence, but I know that if I need to consistently 
you know, eat well, I need a good plan and I need, you know, someone like Ryan to help me through it, right? I, I, I can probably make a so-called meal plan, but not like what a Ryan Fernando or a Kwa would do. So, which is why I always keep in mind, work out consistently, eat right, enjoy your meals whenever you do, you know, the, the cheat meal, I call it the reward meal, but yeah, do it right all the way and enjoy the benefits that the body gets and the mind gets. Thank you, Shrey. Cool. Thank you so much Thank for joining you, me today. Thanks, stay, everyone. Stay yeah. safe and I'll see you in your next you diet session. I'll see you. Happy All New right. Year. Bye-bye. Wish you the same. Okay, so we've got far more questions coming in over here, which I'm going to answer. And um, Anushka says, I'm allergic to gluten and dairy. What can normal middle class people have as an alternative to both gluten and dairy? So Anushka, um, I am also gluten intolerant and I'm also um, lactose and dairy intolerant. So I'm exactly like you. Um, I look at cashew milk. I look at coconut milk. I look at uh, almond milk uh, and I look at oat milk. Urban Clap has an amazing oat milk. Now, milk is milk, okay? A milk coffee or, or, a, or a milk rasmalai. There's no difference between cashew and that, okay? You've got to get one thing out of the mind. They're completely different tastes. So you have to transition into accepting the new thing. Like coffee with almond milk and coffee with normal milk is two different worlds. But over a period of two or three years, your taste buds acclimatize. Like for example, today in the morning, I had a sip of coffee with real milk in it because it was made for somebody. And I was like, let me try it, pour a little bit. I had it and I'm like, I don't like this. I like my oat milk coffee. So... <clears throat> That is one perspective. For the gluten perspective, um, rice, oats, corn, jowar, bajra, amaranth, all of these are possible in terms of gluten options. There's, there's a brilliant bakery in Ludhiana called Sai Foods Ludhiana. Sai Foods Ludhiana. They have rusk biscuit, which is gluten free. They have coconut biscuits. As a Kid, I grew up with jam biscuits. I can't believe I'm giving this information out as a nutritionist, okay? But you're human, right? So I would say that at four o'clock in the evening, you want to have two or three jam biscuits uh, or cream biscuits. You do get them gluten-free. Uh, I live in Bangalore and now most of the metros have some amazing bakers. Now, these are people that are going to make us put on weight because gluten-free options are like normal options, full of sugar and full of baking items into it. So... Um, you know, it is what you need to do, which is get in touch with a nutritionist to help you plan a better shopping list, a better uh, a choice of foods, like how much should you eat, you know, at the end of the day. Um, somebody just said my calcium level is inefficient, what should I do? Um, get in touch with us at Koa Nutrition. I do genuinely believe that when you uh, when you try, you know, uh, recently what happened is, so I have this uh, old cycle, okay? So I thought, Are, yaar, old cycle, no, we'll take some free advice from somebody how to get it repaired and all of that stuff. I ended up spending more money because I took free advice. I should have just gone to that cycle mechanic, say, buy ye loro, 500 rupees, isko teek kar do. But inside, Kanjusi fellow inside of me said, no boss, why? who's going to spend and I'll do some Googling up and all of that stuff. Whenever you try to not, I mean, the same thing goes with mobile phones. Do you try and repair your own mobile phone? Do you try and repair your own car? Your car's making a sound, take it to the mechanic. Your calcium levels are out, talk to your doctor, talk to your nutritionist. I think uh, that, that would really, really help you. You know, uh, somebody said they tried whey protein and got a UTI. Um, I, I, would, I would say in 2022, and I know a lot of supplement companies are not going to like me for this. I used to work for supplement companies. I think the problem is not protein. I think the problem first lies with you not knowing how much you need to eat of calories, first level, then how much of protein do you need for in those calories? And then which protein should you add from the natural diet, which I believe can genuinely fulfill your protein requirement. Now, for many years, I took protein supplements and tried to bulk up and, you know, everyone says, oh, Ryan Fernando, you're so skinny. You're a skinny nutritionist. So, you know, there's an internal turmoil like, what can I do? Yeah, my genetics don't allow me to put on weight. I've always been skinny. I had gluten allergies. I had pimples, blee, blue, blah, blah. I would douse myself with all of these whey proteins and plant proteins and nothing would happen and only my gut would be bad. In this case, a person saying I got a UTI. Could it be coincidence? Here's what you do. If you're willing to risk the UTI again, 
do another session three four months later have the whey protein add nettle tea which is a diuretic nettle tea will flush second is add cranberry juice if you're not overweight because what cranberries do is there's the bacteria that causes uti has a hook so that hook helps the bacteria to climb up the ureta which is your urinary canal so that bacteria goes up and causes a uti what you can do is you can take cranberries or cranberry extract or cranberry juice if you're not overweight because cranberry juice is high in sugar and add that to your protein diet and see whether it improves which vegetarian proteins i would recommend if you're a female soy protein works okay a brown rice protein works okay green pea protein works okay so let me give you another perspective in 2022 now when we do microbiome testing and we do food allergy testing what we come up with is that when I've recommended a green pea protein plant-based isolate to my client, my food allergy report says that my client is allergic to green peas. So the biggest problem in today's world is this assumption that I need to take a protein supplement and without testing a food sensitivity or a food intolerance, you douse yourself. Now, how much of green peas can you eat? You can eat a cup of green peas, but one scoop of green pea protein isolate technically is equivalent to nearly six or seven cups of green peas. Who eats that sort of quantity? So imagine the hypoallergic, the, the allergic status that you're putting into your body. So keep this in mind. You do not need to douse high amounts of protein and trainers are recommending high amounts of protein. My only request to you as a trainer, if you're watching in is this, check if your client agrees with that commercially produced protein which is devoid of carbohydrate and fat which is technically making it a processed and packaging food so because it's a processing and packaged food could there be a issue that you're causing by asking your client to douse with this could there be an issue and that's the reason why i say when you decide to do a aggressive fitness program get your diet with a professional done and even if your trainer is handling your diet, ask for a blood test, ask for a food allergy test. If you have enough of money, do the nutrition genetic test. If you have even more money, do a microbiome testing. Last year, I did not buy a new car. I chose to invest more money in understanding more about my microbiome, more about my genetics, more about how my fitness trainer can work with me better. So I think that should be your focus in 2022. Spend more on experiences, and one of those experiences, you yourself. And that's very, very, very important. Somebody asked, how can I reduce triglyceride levels? Again, triglyceride levels, I have seen AMLA uh, as part of the diet works. Reduce your white flour and reduce your white carbohydrates, white rice. You will see a drop in the fructose and the triglyceride levels. Uh, and also try and um, maybe work more with vegetables and less with fruits again on a case-to-case -case basis i can work very aggressively with you and figure out what can be done so gaurav uh, if money is not an issue for many of you and gaurav uh, you're, you're looking to spend on a vacation where you'd spend 30 40 50 000 rupees i would say gaurav do a blood test enroll with a nutritionist for three months and figure out what works very very well for your body so sarvesh is asking I have a BMI of 18.5 and 53 kgs weight. I have some body fat to lose from my love handles. I want to gain muscle mass at the same time. How can I do this? Suresh, very simple. Virat Kohli gained 5 kgs of muscle and lost 3 kgs of body fat. There is a way to do it based on your genetics, your blood test and everything. My team of sports nutritionists as well as medical nutritionists at Kwan Nutrition can help you do this. It is possible. But it cannot be done on general advice. It can be done only by experimentation by you over a long period of time. See what works for you over three, four years. Keep tweaking your diet, keep tweaking your exercise and see what comes out best. Or go to a good trainer, structure your training program, go to a good nutritionist, structure your nutrition program, have data, have a in-body analysis, which is your body fat percentage, track it over a period of six months is your fat percentage going down is your visceral fat dropping is your muscle percentage increasing i would give you a tip sarvesh which is free for 2022 as my gift to you if you're not allergic to cinnamon dalcini 
start adding quarter teaspoon of cinnamon morning afternoon evening if you don't get acidity and you don't get mouth sores or any issues of acidity then cinnamon is known to improve in fat burning in certain individuals who are response who have a response to what is called as cinnamon aldehyde which kind of mimics um, an insulin booster it increases the receptors of uh, insulin on the cell which allows for greater uh, blood sugar betterment what which exercise would you recommend for fat loss so since the cardiologist is no longer here and the fitness expert is no longer here i have seen with hundreds of my clients including amir khan the recommendation has been to walk to lose visceral fat to walk to lose subcutaneous fat you need more than 15000 steps a day you need more than 15000 steps a day you need to walk because when you are in a low energy heart rate you utilize fat as a battery so let me explain this to you very easily okay so imagine uh, the red pen as my carbohydrate and the orange pen as my uh, as my uh, fat so every muscle in the human body uh, will utilize either carbohydrate or utilize fat when you do low intensity activity jadu pocha walking in your house going up the stairs neat non exercise adaptive thermogenesis you utilize more amount of fat up to 70% of the energy requirement during that period comes from fat and 30% from carbohydrate now the moment you start running and your heart is not conditioned your heart is not conditioned your heart rate goes up and then you start using more and more carbohydrate as a substrate and lesser and lesser fat so the secret to fat burning is slow intensity for your heart but longer duration to recruit the fat burning battery and this is the essential secret in addition to uh, monitoring your diet so very very important if you want to do a nutrition plan with me um, you can you can do it at the qua nutrition clinics uh, it's so so important that um, i feel that in 2022 spend some money on your body towards you know getting healthier um, suji asked should i avoid uh, gluten content when i have a thyroid at the face value uh, suji, suji what i would say to you <laughs> suji if i can make a joke uh, you get gluten free suji and you get normal suji which is made from rava which is made from wheat traditionally suji in india was always in south india made with rice and that's why people didn't have problem i think a lot of suji that is made today is made with gluten based wheat because maida is cheaper uh, so 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 uh, yeah uh, my my information is if you do a gene test and you're gluten sensitive you have the dna in you then i would advise you to go off gluten but also look at tsh thyroid stimulating hormone requires 10 nutrients for its functioning tsh is situated release from the pituitary which goes and acts on your thyroid t3 t4 but people immediately say oh tsh is not working let's take a medicine so you go directly over here instead i'm saying what are those 10 nutrients for your tsh to work well my wife when i married her had thyroid for the longest period today she takes not a single medication for her thyroid gluten free and those 10 micronutrients of which vitamin d vitamin b12 uh, vitamin c chromium selenium magnesium zinc and an amino acid which i can't forget which i'm forgetting right now but there are 10 micronutrients that are highly required for your thyroid tsh functioning and i think our nutrition is lacking and that's why it goes uh, um, uh, you know bad anushka is saying i try to eat clean most of the times but then i'm not able to achieve my flawless skin goals though i have good genetics i have omega-3 and vitamin c and water so if, if if so when anushka sharma the film star came to me the whole perspective was i need filters of testing blood test food intolerance test genetic test microbiome test put all of these filters figure out what are the foods you cannot eat the moment you start moving those foods out uh, so anushka if you see i have had adult acne all my life so i've got poked up skin 
Now, as a teenager, if somebody met me and told me, Ryan, you are gluten sensitive, I would have been like, okay, let's try it. But in 1996, when I was in medical college and had pimples, nobody told me about it. But in 2011, when I did the gene testing, it came back, hey, Mr. Gohan Fernando, you are not supposed to eat gluten. I stopped it and I never had adult acne for 20 days of stopping gluten. And I'm like, whoa, I have all my skin drying out, my pimples are disappearing. And I went on to a six month gluten free and I didn't have a pimple. And my wife's birthday was on the 27th and I ate gluten cake that came for her. I popped in a gluten enzyme tablet, but I got a sty on my eye. If you can see over here, I never get styes, never. I used to get it when I was taking gluten and I was like, ah, it's the gluten, it's the gluten in the cake. Maybe it's the milk. I ate a lot of Christmas chocolates. So skin, what, you know, if I take my skin and I fold it on the inside, it becomes my throat, my stomach, my intestines, it becomes everything. So what kujili and damage is happening out there comes up on your skin. So if you want to glow, you got to change your diet. I would suggest do the correct, Anushka, do the correct diagnostics, figure out the kujili molecules, get them out of your life, and then put in the molecules that are good, doing very well for you. You've written omega-3. I've had one client once in my life, when we gave her omega-3, she got worse skin. Omega-3 is brilliant. Omega-3 is really, really brilliant for good health. But go figure, not all, not all foods fit for the same person in the same uh, what you say, tenacity or same action. And that's why I formed Qua Nutrition. Qua in Latin means incapacity. So figure out what foods uh, you can, uh, 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 you know, put into it. No, Novak Djokovic says, I'm gluten intolerant. So <laughs> thanks for the joke, whoever put it over there. I have been watching uh, uh, Novak and I've got all his books since 2011. And I would shout from the treetops to all the sports people, including Shushil Kumar, who won two Olympic medals with me. Okay, beta, do not take gluten in your diet if you want to win an Olympic medal. I'm going to be working in 2022 with PV Sindhu. I'm going to try and convince her not to have gluten in her diet for better athletic performance. I'm writing a book next year on why wheat why we should not eat it. Even if you're not gluten sensitive, there's enough proof in the pudding, which is a simple thing all of you could do. For 20 days, don't eat any wheat-based product. Check your resting heart rate. 20 days, don't eat any gluten in your diet. If your resting heart rate comes down, gluten is a culprit in life. Try that as an experiment if you have the patience and time. Which are the best cooking oils to be used in a home? Hey, there is no best cooking oil to use on your whole. It is bio-individual. In my house, there are two bottles of oil, which has a man pitcher and a woman pitcher. My wife is from the east coast of India. I'm from the west coast of India. Completely genetic different profiles in terms of coconut oil works for me. Mustard oil works for her. Olive oil works for her. Olive oil doesn't work for me. So you got to figure it out from a genetic perspective. Is soy fit soya milk really good for a 10-year-old who competes? Neha, if your kid is a boy, I would not give soya milk more than twice a week. I'd have to work with my dietitian for your kid uh, in terms of what could be the other dietary natural alternatives. Uh, and if your child is a girl, then soya milk is okay. But these commercial companies, I'm not too happy with the amount of sugar that they put into it. So what I would do is I would go more with like tempeh, which is fermented soya, which tastes and feels like paneer and make natural dishes like that or make like a cottage cheese rasmalai. But the rasmalai is, is replaced with the tempeh and it comes out really nicely. Just the just replace paneer with with uh, with with the with the tempeh and you could make a sweet dish for your kid to get more protein. Is Amway plant protein good? Um, I used to work for Amway many, many years ago in the past life. I don't believe any company is creating a bad product. I believe you individually might select a good company's product that is bad for your gut. You want me to repeat that? I believe there is no bad company out there that creates a nutritional supplement. What I do genuinely believe is that people choose these good products but that product is physiologically bad for your body. So it's no one size that fits all. Okay. 
Um, Nandini says, I've had quite a bit of success with the QA program. Thank you, Ryan. You're most welcome, Nandini. And thank you for stating that on a public forum. Every day I get up in the morning asking myself, should I be a celebrity nutritionist? Should I teach 50 of my dietitians at QA Nutrition? The reason I do what I do is because one Ryan can serve about 200 clients a year. I want to serve 200 million people in India. Right now, we're only 50 dietitians. The way to go forward is for everyone who watches our videos, who enrolls in a core nutrition program to become brand ambassadors, to convince people to discover their own qua. Qua in Latin means in capacity. Discover your own capacity for exercise. Discover your capacity for thinking. Discover your capacity for sleeping. Discover your capacity for nutrition what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat. Somebody asked me about intermittent fasting. Is it good? It's individual. Intermittent fasting works very badly for me. It gives me acidity. My wife has got the most amazing results with intermittent fasting in the last three years, as have many of my sports clients when they went into the lockdown. All right, we've gone really, really long today. It's been a one and a half hour session. I would like to thank my team at Qua Nutrition for a great job in 2021. Um, for you uh, coming in over here, Rashmi, Anubhav, and Rudul, thank you so much for helping me out on this live. To the rest of my dietitians who are listening in, thank you for being the healers in this country. I don't know if people know this, but I consider dietitians as angels who are put on this planet to change the way you eat. Whilst you will have a devil and you will have an angel on your shoulder, you should eat that cake. You should not eat that cake. You should eat that cake. You should not eat that cake. Well, it's not two cakes. It's two personalities inside of you. By going in for nutritional counseling sessions and just talking to a person one-on-one, -on -one, you will change your behavior. Have you ever remembered in school when your teacher took you aside and said, Ryan, you're not studying hard enough. If you studied harder and did not look at all the girls, you would be a, a, a much more smarter student. I got that advice. I didn't listen to much of it. Maybe if that teacher had persevered a little bit more, I wouldn't be looking at the girls so much and studied a little harder. You know, you get the point. So I wanted to enroll with my nutritionist, with my dietitians, because after school, you're not accountable to anybody. Think about it. After 22 years of age, are you accountable to anybody? You have your own salary, you do everything. Yeah, once you get married, you're accountable to your spouse, your better half. Mostly husbands are accountable to their wives. I don't think it's vice versa. Women are the home ministers, finance ministers, they control everything. If you're a guy who's uh, controlling everything, please give me the secrets of what you need to do. But jokes apart, jokes apart. We don't report into anyone. So what is the reason that you will continue in 2022 on a diet or an exercise plan? Ghanta, you will do anything. Nothing you will do after this seminar is over. It's gone. It's over. Maybe some 10, 15 people are watching this. I don't even know sometimes why I do this stuff, but I do this stuff because I'm hoping that one person turns out to be Fardin Khan who watched a video of mine and then met Dr. Ali Irani. And he said, you know what, go to Ryan Fernando. He'll help you in a transformation. I, I am waiting. I am waiting for you guys to see his transformation when his movie launches next year. So with that, I leave you with a word of wisdom. Do not try to do it yourself. Recruit your family, recruit your friends, recruit a trainer, recruit a nutritionist, recruit a mind coach. That's what you need to do in 2022. You're born with only one vehicle. That's yourself. You can upgrade it. You can't change it. Get on the bandwagon, upgrade it in 2022. God bless you and have a great year ahead. All my wishes to everyone out there. And thank you so much for being a fan. Thank you so much for being a client. Thank you so much for being a person on my team. God bless you and uh, may God keep you safe in 2022.